Hey, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly. It's your friend, Rick from Blind. And today I'm here to introduce you to Amir Nethu, who's the founder and CEO of OutSchool. OutSchool is a community marketplace for live online classes for kids. There are more than 100,000 educational classes for everything from learning to draw, how to bake, how to cook, uh, even how to code, plus things like how to clean your room. And it's taught by more than 12,000 teachers. You know, we were really impressed with OutSchool because we we're impressed with like how stunning some of the um, outcomes are for the students and the teachers. Some of the teachers can earn upwards of $100,000 a year teaching on OutSchool, and some others supplement their income further by offering one-on-one -on -one tutoring on the platform. So it's a, a pretty cool piece of education tech that we can uh, walk you through. So thanks for coming on the show, Amir. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to be here. Thanks so much for that introduction. <laughs> so I have to ask, with such an impressive career, can you just give us a walkthrough? Can you walk us through your career and, and how you got to this point? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you the short version because I've, I've had a number of different uh, uh, pieces to my my career. Happy to go into into depth into into any one. Um, you know, one thing about my career is I always wanted, from a young age, to be a software entrepreneur. Um, I think maybe at age fourteen, I was like, I want to be a software entrepreneur, or I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> and you know, yeah, astronauts yeah. are very a very typical kind of ambition for for a kid. Um, you know, I explored the path uh, in, from the UK uh, where I grew up. You know, I have to become a fighter pilot and then a test pilot. Um, I didn't want to go down that path for various reasons. So that was one option. But um, you know, software entrepreneur was the other option. And you know, the the root cause of it, I think, was I got into software really early. Um, I got exposed to it when I was a, a young kid. Um, I was very lucky to um, have got one, an early computer, a BBC Micro, and have my parents help me pursue my interests in software. And then my father was an entrepreneur, so I think that's where it came from. Um, I started my career, though, um, after college at IBM. I joined their software development group, the idea being to get some core skills in software. And then I did uh, found my first company in um, 2008. I um, got to a certain level of success. Um, uh, had it acquired by by Square, uh, spent some time at Square as a product manager in their early days, tremendous experience before uh, founding my second um, company, OutSchool, in, in 2015. So that's kind of the overview of the, the my journey and where it started. Now, how did you find your co-founders or and come up with the idea for OutSchool? Because my understanding is education is just so complex. There's so many ways to tackle it. Um, obviously, you went the marketplace route and really connecting people directly to teachers for specific needs, which is um, pretty impressive. But I mean, how did you get from A to B? Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's really interesting because you also might might look at my career and say, well, hey, you know, out schools an education product, but you know, I spent all the rest of my career in other industries and, and in software. Um, but, you know, a couple of missing pieces which which make the connection, um, both my parents were teachers. Um, and, you know, as, I, as I, I talked about, they were very influential on me, not just in terms of how they supported my schooling, um, but also in how they helped me pursue interests out, outside of school, um, such as, you know, my interest in computers and, and software. Um, and so I've had an affinity for education for a while. And then, um, you know, I have kids now, but I didn't have kids when I first started out of school, but they were on the horizon and I wanted to create a product that they would, they would use. And this got me reflecting on my own childhood and reflecting on the future and what, um, what I think families uh, want today. And, and also just like the, the changes in the world and how the education system um, has changed. And so I started to form some theses about what the future could look like or what the opportunities in education are. I started to experiment with those um, those ideas. And, you know, where I left Square, I wasn't sure yet whether I wanted to pursue a startup, but I knew I wanted to scratch that itch. So I spent a lot of time on a very early customer development when I was just working on my own, um, interviewing parents, getting connected with um, parent groups around the San Francisco Bay Area where I now live, and um, especially identifying, um, you know, a group of parents, secular homeschoolers in the Bay Area, who seem to be doing something very interesting that matched my thesis with the future of education. 
And then I published a blog post in April um, 2015 where I kind of summed up my learnings and it got a lot of traction. And I put it out there partly as a forcing function for myself to say, okay, let's really kind of write down what I've learned and some of the theses about what could happen here. But I also had half in the back of my mind, hey, this could be a good way to attract co-founders and attract investors, but it's kind of like a, a thesis memo. Um, it wasn't written like that, but it but it served that purpose. And um, and it worked. You know, one of the my co-founders for, from out school, Mikkel, we joke that we found each other on the internet because he read that blog post. He was at a transition point in his career. And um, we talked and started to work together. And then um, you know, my other co-founder, Nick, um, I'd known for a, a long time through startup circles. We founded first companies at the same time and had the same investors, different companies, but that's how I knew him. And um, he had spent a lot of time at uh, Airbnb as their first employee um, and also as a product manager at Clever. And so yeah, had that education background, has that marketplace background. So yeah, we, we came together as a, as a founding team. So that's kind of a little bit about the kind of influences that led to that um, led to that transition and, and led to OutSchool and, and how we formed as a, as a team. Amir, I'm so glad that you're on the show because my whole family is involved with teaching. And when I say that, it's not exaggeration. My dad was a teacher and later became assistant principal, then a principal. My uncle was a principal. He lived there. He was a superintendent of like a district. My aunts were art teachers. My brother's a school psychologist. So I, I was like the black sheep of the family that went into business and starting a search firm, but everybody else. But, and what, what I see here in the States, particularly in the Northeast and, and New York, it needs a lot of help. The school system is not doing well at all. It has been doing well for a long time. And I think, you know, post COVID where people kind of got lost in the last few years. So to have another source of a way to learn, I think is just so important, so mission critical, and it'd be so helpful because there's so many kids who are in dire need of that, particularly disadvantaged kids. So I, I really am excited to see what you're doing because I'd never heard of this. I, I apologize until I, I, you know, Rick shared with me that you're going to be on. And then I did my homework. I'm like, this is great. This is something that's really super needed. And I'm not saying this to be nice. I'm just being honest that this is, uh, this is something that I think all parents who are watching this, and this is one of the reasons I, I, I'm glad that we're going to go live so they could see it and they could tell like their kids, wait a minute, we have another option to do. So, so this is really cool. Yeah, I'm likewise excited. And, 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 and Jack, I mean, you, you're in business, but I mean, this is an educational device that we have right here. <laughs> so the, the, link, uh, the link doesn't surprise me, but I really appreciate you saying that. I want to tap into that dog fooding, drink your own champagne stage of the startup. You know, there are quite a few technologists, uh, tech professionals listening to this right now who are considering starting their own startup and marketplace kind of business models are all the rage. You know, you see some of the largest public companies, Airbnb, Uber, DoorDash, Instacart, all focused around this marketplace model. And I, I want to kind of ask for your expertise. How do you get past this kind of cold start problem, right? Where you need teachers to come on, but there aren't students and then vice versa students and, and, and parents want their kids to come on and, and, and learn, but maybe the selection of coursework or uh, the teachers aren't to their liking. H how did you get like that solved in the early days? Um, yeah, it's really tough and it's, it's really kind of scrappy. Um, there's this expression that's, uh, you know, now used, which I think is great. It's based on a Paul Graham essay, which is do things that don't scale. So when you are in the earliest days of trying to get get it to get things to work, especially in a marketplace where you're kind of like a chicken and egg, um, where you need demand in order to attract supply and vice versa, you can't be thinking about like you know how do you get like to this to like a million buyers. You need to be thinking one. You're going to look this person in the eye and you're going to say, hey, look, I know I don't have supply now, but make a bet on me. Or you're going to look at the supply side and say, hey, I don't have demand now. Come partner with me. Let's try this, and I think it could be great. So, you, it, you know, in the very early days of consumer startups and consumer marketplace, I actually think the activities look more like 
B2B customer development where you, and, and, it, and a lot of people don't realize that they think, oh, in consumer, how can you possibly be selling one person at a time? Like clearly the dollar amounts make no sense. But that's that's scale thinking. You know, you're not going to do this forever, but you need to you attract those customers one at a time until you get to 10. And then maybe you can start to think of, oh, I'm going to attract customers in two increments of two, not one. And that's how you that's how you kind of you kind of scale up. And it's really, it's really tough. And yeah, you know, one thing to bear in mind, I've talked a lot about myself being a customer of uh, of my product, but I wasn't in the early days. I didn't have kids yet. <laughs> and what's more. The majority of our families now and, and the families that I was working with you know, back in the early days, you're mostly working with the mom. So I had a question about whether I as a founder could even do this. You know, I um, wasn't even a parent at that, at that stage. You know, I wasn't a mom. Could I even do this? But I think it, it turned out that that didn't actually matter. Um, as long as you were able to empathize with the customer and understand their perspective and really earn the right to walk side by side with them. It meant more work that you had to really kind of listen and try and assess the signals and recognize that, you know, you're not them. Um, but, um, you know, if you were able to kind of, you know, switch off your own filters and really get into their mindset, um, that was the most important thing in, in kind of building trust with that with early customer base. I'd say it's a super fun time um, for an entrepreneur because you're really hands-on in those early days. But a lot of people find it tough because, you know, there's not the immediate reward in terms of scale. It can seem more trivial than people realize. I think a, a lot of what holds people back uh, um, uh, to starting a startup or um, being successful at those first stage is just the kind of the status thing. You're not inventing fancy strategies and doing decks. There's not a lot of dollars involved. Like on no metric is this like high status work. <laughs> I mean, it can turn into that if you're successful, but you know, going you know, essentially door to door and getting customers one by one is not most people's idea of like what a successful startup looks like. But I, I don't think what I said um, you know, here would um, will be anything other entrepreneurs would 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 contradict. And um, it's that that's the hardest part of going from established role into into a startup. It's just this idea that you're you're giving up this thing that seems important and now you're doing something that seems trivial day to day. That's such great advice because I can imagine when you're starting out and then your peers are talking about all the cool stuff they're doing. And then you say, oh, well, I spoke with, you know, Bobby and Janie's mom and she, she thinks that maybe they're going to take some math classes. <laughs> and then, and you must feel like, oh my gosh, when am I ever going to scale this thing up? I'm going to have to keep doing this every day. And then, <laughs> right? So I imagine for people who are watching this, who are, you know, looking to be an entrepreneur, as Rick mentioned, people from blind, let's say, who say, yeah, I, I want to do something. It's a good way to manage their expectations that, okay, this is going to be a grind, right? This is going to be a long grind till it starts getting, you know, mass, right? Absolutely. And, wow. and, and you know, quite, quite frankly, like, um, you know, there's this, there's this kind of idea, uh, which I agree with, that there's like better and easier ways to get rich than founding a company. <laughs> like if you look at the success rates and the amount of efforts, like, so um, this, this kind of back to kind of founder motivation, it's, it's not enough. You've got to overcome this hurdle, but, but why do you want to overcome this hurdle of, you know, giving up the, um, the secure path to founding a company? I, I don't think financial reasons are enough. It wouldn't be enough for me. And I never recommend someone start a company say, hey, I want to start a company because like I want to be successful. I see these successful founders and you know, I see the wealth that's created because you've also got to remember the failure rate. You've really got to actually enjoy the process and not just enjoy the process of building a business in general, but like have found a fit with the domain. I was so passionate that this change was, I wanted this change to happen um, I want it for my own family. I had some specific insight based on my own journey and, um, you know, the support that my parents had given me as teachers that I felt good about that fan of it. It doesn't necessarily need to be obvious fan of it. Like, you know, who's this guy from who grew up in England, who's like, you know, never spent any part of career in education, thinking about like transforming education. Well, if you look at it at that level, then I wasn't a fit. But actually, if you looked underneath and said, let's look at the motivation, let's look at um, some of where the this inspiration is coming from, 
um, then it's a much better fit. So it doesn't have to be obvious fit, but I think that's an underappreciated part of this, that people talk a lot about product market fit, but I think founder market fit is equally important. Amir, do you feel that there's also something to be said for a beginner's mindset where you come into something with a fresh perspective? So let's say you went to school to be a teacher and then you were a teacher for 20 years and that like all your friends are teachers. So you have, you know, you know, you, that, that tunnel vision of this is what you should do. Whereas you're coming in with a fresh perspective and you can kind of say, wait, that's kind of dumb. I'm not going to do it this way. Why don't we do it this way? You know, just because we've been doing it for 20 years doesn't mean you're doing it right for 20 years. Is there, is there something to that too, to come in for yeah. budding entrepreneurs to say, wait a minute, just because I didn't do this, I could learn and come in with a fresh idea, right? hundred percent. I think there's a lot to be said of that mindset. And that's often why people talk about, you know, sometimes it benefits you as an entrepreneur to, you know, be young. <laughs> or, 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 but it's actually, it's actually less about that. I mean, there's, it's a positive attribute, more about um, you have less things kind of holding you back. And so, um, you know, even the, the, the absence of knowledge actually it can, can sometimes be a positive. I wouldn't say it's true in the global sense though like i had a specific thesis where in education probably a larger change needs to happen a lot of people with existing domain understanding and expertise have tried to apply technology education with limited success so there was a kind of a specific thesis about the domain that maybe an outsider is what's needed here i don't think that's necessarily true in all domains all of the time um so i just like add that note of caution because you also have plenty of examples of maybe disrupting um existing markets more than creating new ones where people with you know, long domain experience are a necessary part of the uh, founding equation. It's like uh, when I hear about Amir's background, like knowing what you know now about how difficult it is, how kind of quote unquote low status it is in terms of like prestige, right? Compared to, you know, working at a big tech company and making, you know, like a bajillion dollars with stock or whatever, that you wanted to do this as a kid. And you you probably saw your 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 father kind of struggle through it and like really push through and I, I mean something about it he completely passed on that grit to you that like that drive and you did it not only once but twice um, <laughs> and you said hey sign, sign me up and I'm going to do it again which I I just um, you know I I wish I had that personality I wish I had that kind of level of drive I'd say. Well, well, hopefully you have a class for it, right? Maybe, maybe right, that's exactly. something America can do it for <laughs> aspiring, well, I, I, you know, <laughs> entrepreneurs who are a little nervous and need some hand holding and a little confidence boost. So right. maybe, maybe that's uh, you know something else they could add to the curriculum. Well, I I, I don't know. It's uh, it's interesting I, because um, I I kind of feel like the the generality here isn't you know I, I want to you know isn't this idea that if you want to become an entrepreneur, you need to have this kind of grit or drive. I believe people have kind of the grit or drive about something. Um, sure. And it's like finding what that is. And for me, it happened to be, you know, the entrepreneurial career. I think one challenge that I observe now with people considering it versus when I um, started out with my first company in 2008 is now doing a startup is kind of cooler and more in the popular culture like there's been whole movies like written about mm -hmm. facebook more recently movies about like starts gone wrong and i think one thing that's uh, a little bit hard for people to unpick is like do they want to be an entrepreneur now becoming an entrepreneur is a more standard path than it than it used to be or is there really that that passion or that drive and i would encourage everyone not to become an entrepreneur because you think it's a challenge or you want to get rich or you've heard about it on a cool podcast but because it's really coming internally from you um and that was also a learning i took into my second company out school which is you know when i started out i didn't know whether i wanted to do a startup again because i knew how hard it was so i kind of wanted the idea to be pulled out of me and the startup to be pulled out of me which is why i worked on it as a project on my own for a period of time first to really check that this isn't coming from just me wanting to do another company but this is coming from an actual need in the market and so that was a flipping mentality that i had between my first company and my second company so when you say a project, so did you just like not really tell anybody, but you were playing around on your uh, on your own and writing code and figuring it out? Yeah. So uh, yeah, kind of. It's not like I wasn't telling one because I was doing customer development, but I didn't do all the normal things you might people think you yeah. you should do at the start of a company, like oh, raise money, get an office, like find co-founders. None of that. It was all just kind of exploring 
the idea space to see whether there's something there um, with early adopter customers and also to sense in myself like is this exciting is this fun you know without any of the trappings of a company or a startup just the work itself and where this could go like am i am i personally inspired by it so i you know compared with my first thought i just spend a lot of time introspecting internal like where's my energy at after a customer interview not not kind of analyzing what was said and what should happen next just like am, am i exiting this this customer interview more excited or less excited than when i when i went in and why like am i being drained by the by the work or feel like i'm pushing a a boulder uphill or as hard as this is you know am i kind of becoming excited energized and that was like an important internal metric for me to use as well as the actual kind of you know the business case the thesis of the market I was developing say is this going in the, in the right direction because ultimately uh, i think you know you, you can't get to scale in a startup unless really the world is pulled out of you you can't just force it because otherwise um you know uh, you know it, it, uh, you'll end up like spending a lot of your energy you'll be end up spending a lot of money going in a direction that people maybe don't want so um, I, I think that's a that's a piece that's underrated is um, you know people being sensitive to their own internal energy with respect to the work. I mean, on that vein, I mean, can we double click into your experience, kind of having a startup, having it acquired as a from a by a big tech company, and then having to work in that big tech company? How did you find that transition from being to being a boss to having many boxes, being layered at a big corporation with, you know, all of these policies and hierarchies and, and, and kind of norms of doing things. Did you find that transition easy to manage or, you know, were you part of that class of founders that are like waiting for that like one year, two year time period when it's kind of like socially accepted for you to kind of leave it and, and go someplace else? Yeah, no, it's a very big change. That's for sure. Maybe bigger than I, than I anticipated, but I had a hell of a lot of fun um, at Square. And I think I did some great work and I was there at a very interesting time where they were growing very rapidly, um, uh, both in terms of revenue and in terms of headcounts. I got to see all the sort of organizational changes. And also, you know, I never worked at a company at that scale before. I'd worked at bigger scale and much smaller scale, but never at the kind of like um, taking off kind of growth stage. And I went in with a thought, hey, I'm not going to be like those other founders who maybe like only do a year or two. You know, I, I really want to learn. I really want to like um, take my time here. I'm not in a rush to do it. And think, else, let, let's do this. And in the end, I was I was there a little bit less than, than two years. And I got the entrepreneurial bug again. <laughs> so I, I was one of those founders. Um, but yeah, it was it was striking. I, I think, um, you know, all the things that you mentioned about some of the difficulties of being in a, in a larger company, excuse me, definitely applied. Um, but yeah, also it was so much fun to be able to hone my craft, <laughs> excuse me, and just, um, and just focus on products and, uh, and to have the resources of a large company. So the big upsides in terms of that and the impact to be able to build products against an existing customer base. So I'd say that there was tremendous upsides. There were, there were some challenges. I did come to the end of the time, my time there and think, Though, and this is where I really got the entrepreneurial bug again. At that point, I, I had the ideas behind school, but I was also like, hey, look, if I'm going to be part of a growth stage company at this stage, you know what I really want to be doing? I like my job, but what I really want to be doing is running it. <laughs> because, you know, I had my own ideas about what the strategy should be, and I wanted that challenge. Um, and uh, and so, you know, that was a catalyst for me, for me, you know, figuring out my next steps. Um, but, you know, I think one other thing that was a motivator for me at the time aside from the obvious one of having the exit for my 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 first business um was also just this idea that I, you know i'd spent so much time as an entrepreneur i didn't really know where i stood with respect to my skills and i really wanted also to frankly have on my resume um uh, you know some uh, companies at a different stage and, and have that brand name because i really resent this and as a hiring manager i, I really resist this mm. but there is just this fact in the valley that sometimes dollars follow these brand name companies. So when it comes from investors wanting to invest in companies, they they like to see that you've been part of um, these other rocket ship companies. Or even when you're you know looking to apply for new roles, I think you, I think it's a bad habit and, um, that um, hiring managers and investors uh, have. But it is also a reality that some are still wedded into that that way of thinking. 
So it was it was important to me to you know get that experience and get that signal of the experience that I see the company at that stage. Do you have any other kind of like career mapping advice for for senior professionals who are looking to take that next step in your career? I mean, having that like name brand almost as a shortcut that that's a new one that I I hadn't thought about before in the context of uh, kind of signaling in terms of. Hey, you know, for investors, oh, this guy has kind of clearly seen it all. He might have mm. like picked up the, 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 you know, the the, the game plan or, or or the roadmap. Or alternatively, like, oh wow, he's a he's a serial entrepreneur. He's had an exit before. He's he can clearly perhaps do it again. Uh, any other kind of advice there? I I think this is a bit more of advice of what not to do. Um, okay, and um. Uh, one thing I see is often people are very reluctant to make any kind of career move where it might be seen that they're taking a step back. Like people want very obvious, can want like very obvious progression in terms of title increase or visit, some kind of visible metrics. Whereas a lot of the most successful people I know have been willing to take side steps or even steps that look odd and a bit, um, a bit kind of maybe even down in order to get on a different trajectory. And people don't appreciate that if you want to change the trajectory of the career, you're probably going to have to take some risk. If you're not, if you're not happy, yeah, maybe you're happy with the trajectory, you're fine. If you're not, and you want to actually get on a different trajectory, you're going to have to make a bigger change. And that involves taking some risk and that involves a step back. And just because you don't have a linear career, doesn't mean you're doing the wrong thing. Uh, it doesn't mean you're not going to be successful. It doesn't mean other people are going to perceive you as being successful. Just be very, um, just have a very clear vision and understanding why you're making this change. Hey, look, like maybe I don't, I don't think I'm in the right industry that's really going to be taking off in the next 10 years. So I want to step into a different industry. That probably means taking a step back. Um, or I'm just not loving my work <laughs> and, and I, I want to do something that I love. I might need to make a change. And, um, you know, it's funny, I also reflect on, on my wife's career, you know, she probably come and speak for herself, but, you know, she's the um, CFO at Y Combinator, and she sometimes gets asked, like, you know, by early finance people, how did you become a CFO? <laughs> or how should I become a CFO? And I remember when she joined Y Combinator as the first employee, she was taking out the trash bag as well as doing, like, the, the high powered work. And her... Her colleagues and bosses at um, you know, her previous firm said, ah, you'll be bored. Like, <laughs> why come on it? <laughs> and, you know, it's a non, you know, non, non-standard career move and, um, you know, has resulted in, in tremendous success for her. And I see examples of this all the time. And I see the counterexamples of people who have got to, like, the C-suite, but maybe not in the best companies or not in the largest companies, and now feel like I can't take anything other than a C-level role. And, but a C-level role in a certain interest or company looks very different from your know, C-level role at a, at a scaled um, a scaled consumer company. And it, it, it's almost like if you get that kind of external recognition too early and are not willing to give it up, it can be a real hindrance in your career. So um, uh, I, I guess on the positive part, I just say, focus on the learning and the opportunity and where you're going more than the short-term external um, signals as, as being the the guide. Jack, I, I I think you might identify with this, right? Because our our audiences, right, the, the banking audience, the tech audience, I'm blind. They are what I call the optimizers, right? Mm-hmm. They are looking in terms of how to optimize their pay, how to get to the next job level as fast as possible, or how to break into a certain quote unquote tier of company, right? everyone in software engineering seems to want to work at you know the big five tech companies or if you're in banking everyone wants to work at goldman or something of the like right and so they're very hesitant to go work at a maybe smaller firm or even a startup that no one has heard about and so i really appreciate this kind of lesson in terms of optimizing for the lessons or the skills or the breath that you can bring into your career, because I, I think it's an important lesson that people often forget, right? They think, well, I'm doing the right thing by optimizing for promotions, right? Because that's how you get that impact. And that's how I can add that extra line to my 
career and say, hey, I, I've managed a team of 10 people and now it's a team of 20 and a budget of $10 million or, or, or something. How, like, how did you learn that lesson? Did you have to learn it the hard way or did someone kind of sit you down and, and just like this kind of share that with you? I think it's a really interesting question. You know, almost in, in my early career, I was, I'm like the opposite example. I didn't care enough about progression <laughs> because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I cared about a sense of success, but, but I wasn't measuring it through things like, you know, promotions. Um, and in fact, really the square realization, my square period of time where I realized, oh, it would be valuable to get this kind of brand anniversary was almost be realizing what everyone else had realized before. So I think I'm a, I'm a little different, but then I also observed this year with the examples I gave of just as a hiring manager, looking at other people's careers and where they appear to get, get stuck or, or where they appear to accelerate. Um, so it's not that I'm saying you completely ignore <laughs> the brand names or, or the progressions sure. I clearly learned from like not caring about that at all to, uh, you kind of need to pay some attention to that. I just think people are often too skewed, um, uh, to, to the other way, but I think it, it what really, what, what you should really think about, what I'd advise people to think about is over what time scale, what are you optimizing for and over what time scale? because it's perfectly reasonable as a strategy to say, Hey, look. Um, I'm not coming from a privileged get background here. I want to make sure I'm financially secure in order that I want to start a company or do, or do, do something else. So what I should be doing is for the next uh, X years, I want to hit these financial milestones. I want to do that the most efficient and quick way as possible. And But then if you're really executing that strategy, then most people are way no, nowhere near aggressive enough at moving companies um, and uh, too worried about things like, oh, what will it look like in the long term if I have a bunch of short stints? But I think you need to have a strategy and that's what people miss. And the strategy has got to be beyond, um, you know, I, I want a lot of money in 20 years time. It's got to be the specific path to get there. It's like, hey, look, I'm going to make myself comfortable in the next five years and do it as fast as possible. And then I'm going to um, take some swings, um, whatever kind of that riskier swing uh, means for you. But have that strategy. I mean, it can change and it can be emergent, but you know, especially when I'm talking to candidates as a hiring manager, I really appreciate people coming in and having that intent that they have a they have a pathway and a strategy of what they're trying to achieve in their personal life. Because I think having that strategy in their personal life and career indicates uh, um, a focus that they'll also bring to their work work with us. I mean, as a hiring manager yourself, I, I'm sure you're speaking with like quite senior folks. I mean, are you explicitly asking these questions? Like what has been your strategy in your career? Is this something that you kind of figure out as you're reviewing the resumes that land on your desk? Or, or how do you suss that out as a hiring manager? Can you give us that insight? Well, a, a lot of it can come down to a simple question. Um, where are you in your career and um, you know, where are you going? And that often elicits a fairly long response, in, but basically includes their own internal characterization of how they've seen their journey. And you can get from that, like, you know, how intentional was it? And you can start delving into what were the highlights and lowlights along the way. And by the way, if there are no lowlights, then that's kind of a, a negative signal. But, you know, like, have you have you seen challenge or things not going to 100% uh, according to plan? <laughs> it was that startup life, you know, there's going to be mistakes and 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 um and pieces says it's not about kind of like presenting a rosy narrative but it's about like having a concrete narrative about what, what it is that's happened and what you've learned from that and as a result where you're going and amir for yourself do you have like a plan how large can this get do you have that outlined or, or you're just taking it a day at a time like you started <laughs> out and not looking to say all right we're going to be in every country all over the world do you have do you have your own game plan that you want to share or kind of tidbits about what you think is going to happen or want to happen? Well, after the advice I've just given, I'd better better <laughs> have, a, have a strategy. No, I do, and 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 you know, um, I committed to out school for the long term when I started, mm -hmm. and one of my theories is being uh, about being a good fit for founding a company like out school was the willingness to be very very, very patient as well as being very ambitious. Because in education and startups, you can't tell how long the journey is going to be, but generally it's going to be a long time. So you know, I you know, I'm on a ten to twenty year arc um, without school. Like that's I think in decades, um, uh, based on my happiness 
uh, with what I do, my happiness with the progress, and my strong belief in the opportunity. And what we're trying to do is, you know, not just create a great um, growth stage startup, but one that can go public, one that can become the um, most significant change driver in education, um, you know, be a hundred billion dollar company and really um, take this seemingly intractable problem about how can we build an education system for the future and answer that question. So, you know, obviously things change um, and, you know, uh, strategies change, but as it stands, you know, I'm hundred percent focused and committed to that goal. Um, doesn't leave much time for anything else in between that commitment and, and my kids. So um, I hope this isn't the kind of uh, podcast where you ask me about hobbies because <laughs> I'm a very unbalanced person by, <laughs> by typical metrics on, on that front. <laughs> I, I can see a lot of run room though for you because what's happening here, you know, in the States, there's, there's just so much room for advancement. There's so much room for improvement. So I, I think you're on the right path. And I think the, the growth trajectory could be just off the charts. Coming back to your mission of trying to build this generational, multi-generational, multi-decade business. And you mentioned that you think in terms of decades, but you know, early on in the early days, you did things that just really didn't scale, right? Got down to like individual, like onboarding customers one at a time. At what point did the thinking change? At what point did things really start to click and, and you know, you're, you're seeing your initiatives, your work actually generating that kind of disproportionate leverage or, or, or scale? Well, one thing to clarify is that, you know, from the start of OutSchool, I, I was always long-term focused and, and highly ambitious. And I only wanted to build a company if I thought it could generate that kind of, you know, massive impact uh, that's positive for the world in the long run. And, but yeah, you, you point out this kind of incongruous with having that ambition to go hunting down customers one by one. And, you know, it, um, what allowed me to do that was just a combination of the experience, like doing that kind of customer development work and observing how that's what all the best companies did in the early days so having some confidence that this seemingly you know small scale work could translate and compound into into large scale work and the idea that it's not linear that this effort that you put in in the early days gets increasingly higher leverage as you solve that chicken and egg problem of um, finding more buyers finding more sellers able to attract investment from the growth able to invest more attract more buyers attract more sellers and it, it could compound like that. So it was that combination of experience um, with that, um, seeing it in the ecosystem and um, you know, belief that I could, I could execute on that plan as well. Um, but yeah, it's tough. It's tough to you know, hold that, like both be very ambitious and then you know, be willing to really get into kind of the minutiae. Um, but I, you know, I think it's necessary with startups. You have to both be able to go to, you know, to the very high level ambition strategy and you have to get down into the minutiae. Um, especially in the early days. Was there a point where things just started to click and like it started being less of a grind? And, and, and when was that kind of like pivot moment or that aha moment? Yes and no. So here's the thing. So stuff starts to work and suddenly it's like, it's like, I don't know, your, your skis are starting to like go away from you. You're, you're, you're kind of scrambling to, to keep up. So that starts to happen. At the same time as that starts to happen, something else becomes a grind. So the grind never goes away. It's just that they're parts. <laughs> but something inevitably breaks when you're going, when you, when you start to accelerate. And that then becomes the grind where you're getting into the minutiae and, and spending a lot of attention that seems like wrong. So um, that's where this idea that, you know, the grind never stops, it never becomes any easier. So again, the idea that it becomes easier, wrong. <laughs> if anything, the stakes are higher. So now you're having to, you know, do these, uh, do these, uh, you know, getting into the new show, but if it doesn't work, things are going to go really badly wrong and you, you know, you're going to squander this opportunity. So, um, so that, so that as a result, there was no one point, you know, I can remember the time when we got our, you know, got to a certain scale where we started to have customers on board by themselves without me having to go out and recruiting everyone. That was like a key point when we we're still in the tens of customers. I can remember the moments when we, um, you know, had our first teachers able to complete the application process on the supply side without without um, you know, manual intervention in terms of review, but no kind of 
other kind of manual support handling. I can remember when we turned on larger scale marketing and it worked. I can remember the time where, you know, we grew 15x um, in one year with the COVID tailwinds. Um, you know, right now we're seeing like our, uh, growth uh, on the tutoring side of our business and the economics of that being incredible. And so at every point, there's like something that's working and then there's something that's real drag. So, uh, you know, it's a myth that there's one moment of product market fit. Um, there are constant moments of getting better and better fit. Um, and uh, that, you know, that's how I characterize the journey of a, of a startup between those kind of mar milestones and waypoints of, uh, of fit. I mean, not, not, not to kind of be too facetious, but it, it sounds like the job or the day-to-day -day of a startup CEO is almost like playing a game of whack-a-mole. <laughs> where you, you never know what's going to yeah. come up next. I mean, is, is that too fine of a point? Or, you know, what does the day-to-day -day look like for a startup CEO? Has it changed from, you know, wh what it's like now at OutSchool versus your first startup? Um, you know, have, have you kind of learned how to better kind of structure your day or, or, or what you're kind of driving for now versus previously? Um, you know, I'm always learning on that front and it, it changes at, at each phase of exactly how to organize your day. But you're not wrong about this idea of whack-a-mole. I'll just say it, it's, you know, part of it is, you know, you come up with plans, you come up with strategies to develop structures in order to execute them. So a chunk of your day is spent on on that, either, either developing those plans or executing them. That's the kind of more predictable part. And then something always comes up out of left field and blindsides you, like, you know, um, uh, a key development in the in the market, like something's changed that has like massively increased demand or decreased demand. How do you respond to that? COVID was being a you know an example of that, a, a very large one that came from left field, or um, just more operational things like you know we're we're dealing with a situation with dissatisfaction with a teacher, or you know a problem internally with the team, and those kind of things will come in. So it's a balance between that kind of whack-a-mole sort of kind of activity of fixing problems uh, while also kind of developing practice strategies. And, you know, it changes in time, you know, at points in our school's trajectory, especially like with all the changes in COVID, a lot of it was spent in reactive mode, like, hey, we just need to like, you know, shift things and keep the wheels in the wagon while everything's changing around us. And then other times you can kind of take a step back and focus on more the proactive part. Um, I think one change from the, in the earliest days, um, one change um, uh, since then has been just that there's a lot more um, things come to me as opposed to me have to go and find them. You know, if you wake up in the morning at the very earliest stage of startup and do nothing, like nothing's going to happen. The only, the, only, the only person who's going to shift stuff forward is you. Whereas I could wake up in the morning today and now I'll get a dozen inbound to-do items or things like I, I could be acting on you know, basically brought to me. So it's almost like the pressure comes from the outside and I've got to like clear space to, to you know, do some do some of the proactive um, stuff. So that's kind of a change in change in nature. And it can be feel very different if you're used to being in a company where you walk in and, you know, you open up your queue. You usually have like a queue of bugs if you're an engineer or a queue of customer requests or you can open up your project tracker and look at the to-do items. You know, in the earlier stages of startups, none of that exists. The only person putting things on your list is you. Um, and so, so that's a big change in, in character between the earlier stages and, and later stages. So it's definitely very different than when people look at it from the outside. You know, you, you're successful, maybe a couple of little bumps, but boom, rocket ship just going up. But really behind the scenes, it's not very glamorous at times where you think you're doing well and then you hit with something else and then you figure it out and then you hit with something else and you figure it out and you hit with something else. So for the people what Rick was talking about, let's say the folks on Blind who are thinking of you know, making this kind of pivot, that if they see it, that's natural. It's not just that, that this is, this is right, the course that you're taking, unless you're very fortunate and you hit it good. But you're right. You look behind the scenes. And, you know, what I think there's a challenge in that over the longer term in that, uh, and maybe we see this in some of the, the leaders of very successful startups, is you can become a bit desensitized to like the pain. <laughs> 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 and you can, and in combination with, you know, as you become more successful, you can, you can become overconfident. Because it's like, you know, you've heard a dozen times people say that something can't be done or no, and you've overcome that a dozen times. Or, um, 
you know, you've been through some very, very tough times where you know, things have been difficult, maybe you're getting like bad user feedback and all this stuff that doesn't seem to be working, but you push, you manage to turn things around and push through. And that can be a little dangerous, but it can make you a little bit insensitive um, to um, to different ideas or to certain signals that that things aren't going well. So I I try I try and keep um, you know this beginner's mindset and try and keep um, uh, you know try and stay humble, try and uh, keep listening. It, but it, it, you know it's tough because you've got to be a little bit contrarian. You've got to be a little bit confident as a as an entrepreneur. You've got to believe you can do something that other people can't. And so how do you kind of hold that, but then also um, hold yourself to be to be open and, and vulnerable? I, I really appreciate that reminder because I think it's easy, especially for the, those of us on the outsiders that, you know, aren't actively in the arena, right? Like doing all of that work as a entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a founder, because oftentimes what we see in the news headlines are the highlight reels, right? Like, oh, wow, like, it's the fastest company to to raise X amount or have this many customers or or whatever milestone. Or alternatively, uh, what's being reported is because they are atypical, right? Where it's like, oh, this is the biggest blowout or uh, this scam happened or or whatnot. But I, I really appreciate that reminder in terms of like what's going on on the inside. So thanks for coming on the show, Mir. Yeah, no problem. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ray. This is great. And I love what you're doing. This is fantastic. So I'm, I'm looking forward to your continued success. That's it for The Blind Ambition. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star rating and a review. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.